I can. If you want, we can take it out, but it's gonna look like this. The background noise is increasing. It goes so... like. Oh, look at that. Do you hear me well here? Ah, molto meglio. Much better. Good. Okay. Uh, do you mind to place it horizontally? Geology, geology, geology. Welcome everybody to another show of mini geology. Could geoscientists have a role in the so-called sustainable development? If yes, which role and how could we geoscientists take action? We'll talk about this with Maria Angela Capello. Uh, Maria Angela is here with us. Uh, she's in Houston and uh, we are going to talk with her about her and about her contributions to the Geophysical Sustainability Atlas. Maria Angela is a consultant for the a consortium at the University of Houston and for Geopark, which is an oil and gas uh, company. And above all is director at large in the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, what we know as the SEG. And she is also honorary member and distinguished lecturer this year for the Society of Petroleum <laughs> Engineers that we know as SPE. All right, so Angela, very welcome to uh, the mini geology show. Thank you so much for the invitation. I am delighted to be here, especially because of the topic. Sustainability is close to my heart and it should be close to the heart of everyone in the planet, shouldn't it? <laughs> it should certainly, and it's a hot topic uh, right now. Society is uh, moving very actively uh, into a new direction uh, regarding the new ways to have relationship with nature, uh, new ways to have new um, energies that suffice uh, our many activities in the world. So the Geophysical Sustainability Atlas. This is the title of a very important document that you put together with a team. And uh, if I understand well, the purpose is to champion the role of the geoscientists, more in specific, the uh, geophysicists in sustainable development by aiming to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these are goals that represent a universal call to end poverty and to protect the planet and to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. So would you mind to share with us uh, the specific purpose of this atlas? Well, um, when, you know, I have volunteered for professional societies for decades. And I feel also that something happens when it comes to the, what is the value proposition? we have as a profession. And because of that, I realized that we needed to somehow improve the storytelling, if you may, because we are uh, front actors, uh, frontline actors of society in terms of sustainability, but that was not visible to every one of us. So when I realized that um, there was a way to map what we do to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. I saw this kind of mapping, for example, done by the UNESCO, the cultural branch of the United Nations, towards uh, the many projects they advance in the world. May those be about archaeological sites or cultural heritage uh, things of uh, certain societies. And they are mapping this project for the seven, what are the uh, sustainability goals that this project support. In time, I came to know about the IPECA Atlas, which is one atlas developed mapping what uh, the oil and gas industry did in support of the 17 SDGs, again, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I said, oh, wow. This is a good tool to showcase how our profession supports each one of the SDGs. What so, is our profession? When you say yeah. our profession, what is the profession you are referring to? Yes, uh, I was interested in doing this for the, for the geosciences. And I am a geophysicist. 
So uh, realizing that I had to map a discipline to each one of the 17 SDGs, I felt comfortable doing that within my area of expertise, the core expertise, which is geophysics, right? So I, I thought, should we do this for, for all geosciences? The answer is yes. But to start with, right, um, I liaise uh, in time again first with Anna Shognesi, a fantastic uh, geophysicist that is now the president elect of SEG. Okay. And uh, then uh, we invited a young professional, a mid career professional, and her name is Emer Kasslin. She resides in Ireland and she's another fantastic, you know, supporter of sustainability and she works for Schlumberger. So she brought a, a, another point of view to this equation. The three of us engage in this beautiful adventure. And very soon, early in the task, we, we decide to do, decided to do this for geophysics, starting uh, with this that we call the Geophysical Sustainability Atlas. Why do you call it Atlas? Because uh, it is a compilation. And uh, we want this uh, to be like a map, a roadmap that will guide the adventures and careers of so many people where they can see themselves and uh, realize where they have already traveled to and perhaps where are the other routes they still need to navigate. Like in an atlas, which is a compilation of maps or a compilation of a fossil catalog is also called an atlas. You know, so an atlas is like a compilation and this is the name we, we chose for it. What was the most difficult aspect of this project? The most difficult aspect, um, if I would say, is the, um, the sharing of these results in, a, in what is a very technical um, set of uh, colleagues in which not necessarily everybody knew about the details of what are the SDGs. So perhaps the most important challenge that we have is to be able to further expand the good vibes, the good wave and the information about what are these 2030 goals that we have all of us, all the nations of the world impose on ourselves. Because the SDGs, the, society, the Sustainable Development Goals, are not necessarily well known. What do you think about this uh, lack of knowledge of such an important, uh, honorable goal and uh, internationally pushed by the most powerful organization in the world? But I think that perhaps the communication campaigns have uh, mostly failed in two items. First, 17 is a very high number of goals. Perhaps uh, if we could cl further cluster them into ma a maximum of five, people can remember those. But it is and more I than the, uh, the memory, is really the knowledge. I mean, uh, the knowledge. The knowledge is not that we don't, many of us, most of the community doesn't even know what they are, not Correct. even talking the number of them. So that is only one aspect I was going to tell you, which is it's difficult to handle let's say, no? And, and that difficult uh, the communication. If we had three, five things uh, to showcase in very simple terms, I think everybody would understand them. But the other thing is that these are very difficult to grasp for technical people. If you tell a technical person, how can you contribute to no poverty in the world? That is almost unattainable and it's very far from you. So you don't feel it, you don't feel you make a difference. So in my opinion, uh, there is a lack of knowledge because there is a lack of understanding of how we contribute to sustainability. What and about, this is why we created the Atlas. What about, uh, Maria Angela, the role of the government? So shouldn't they push uh, farther and in a more stronger way the these uh, messages that they come from the United Nations? Yes, um, I think that um, there is a concept that if you think about that, and I want to use it as an example, will help a lot. There is a difference 
in, in supporting sustainability than supporting ambientalism. And I will explain you why. If you are in a beautiful uh, field, right, that you like is green, you know, there is greenery, trees perhaps, you can imagine yourself among birds, uh, you will not envision any problem. And you will say, oh, I like this, I want, I want to preserve it. The issue comes, and this is when the equation changes. When you understand that, for example, a farm of uh, a corn, right, corn farm, failed, let's say, in 2020, this is an example, because there was not enough rain. So is that going to happen next year again? And we will not be able to harvest this corn? So when the environment is related to the human species for your own survival or maintenance, then, you know, the concept becomes sustainability. Sustainability is a concept related to the humans in the sense that how they use technology, resources, etc., and preserve it in such a way that we as humans can live and stay in this planet longer. The term Sorry, in the, uh, in the concept of sustainability that you are explaining, yes. it is yes. unique or there is a debate about what sustainability means uh, and maybe different stakeholders they have a different concept of the term sustainability i think that if we all would understand uh, the concept as related to the human being in order for the human being to stay longer in the planet without affecting the future of our children and grandchildren and future generations the the planet earth as a geologist you know very well this daniel um there have there has been massive extinctions. There have been Milankovic cycles in which the, the climate totally changed. And we know it, right, as geologists, because we can read these millions of years and eons of, of geologic history with so many changes. Sustainability, in my opinion, is, you know, is a concept that is completely attached to the sustainability of the humankind. And because of that, we need to advance the economy, industry, energy, and other things in order to reduce the poverty, right? And reduce the poverty in a sustainable way with the environment. So there are three pillars of sustainability, economic development, social development, and the preservation of the environment. So resources are not unlimited. Is this something that you think uh, personally or that you feel you can say that you represent uh, uh, specific societies or specific groups, uh, especially after you uh, contribute to the Atlas and you are ready now to disseminate uh, the content of this uh, Atlas? I have researched about the concept of sustainability and, and what grounds uh, these noble purposes of the 17 SDGs. And I am convinced that um, I, do, I do not represent any particular society or, or movement at all. What I think uh, I am willing to do is sharing very basic concepts that if properly explained, will probably shift mindsets. And this is my purpose. I want to show geophysicists, that they have a big contribution for society. I want to uh, provide a tool that will be like a mirror where you can see yourself and understand that as a geophysicist in this case, um, most probably we want to expand this to all geosciences. There is the, not only the chance, but the certainty that you are contributing to society, to the economic development of the planet, of the society, and of the industry in which we belong. In a sense, you uh, with the Atlas, uh, you are trying to provide a sense of pride and, and belonging yes. to your community. And uh, we said in specific geophysicists, but then hopefully in the near future about geosciences at large. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, Daniel. Thank you for that. 
not only me, but also my awesome co-authors, Anna and Imer, uh, what we want to do with this atlas is to make sure that we have this sense of pride, this sense of belonging, that, you know, we have a, one of the most wonderful professions in order to help society to understand what is going on around us. And also for the readiness of society, because we need to be prepared for the understanding about earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis, coastal erosion and, and glacial uh, melting and other phenomena. So how do you <laughs> see the current situation about this um, moment of weakness of the industry oil and gas is facing, including the many layoffs uh, that are going on uh, in the present in the in the near future with respect to this sense of pride and belonging that you are trying to build up. Isn't like kind of in a contradictory situation or two different forces is that they go in different directions. On one side, you try to unify, but then on the other side, there's a industry that is almost disappearing. Well, first of all, the Atlas is for all applications of geophysics. So it's not only related to oil and gas. Certainly, uh, the atlas is uh, for uh, near surface geophysics, which is so much relatable to the, for example, infrastructure, maintenance, and uh, geothermal. Uh, the geophysics atlas also provides the opportunity to understand, for example, the, the beauty of uh, geophysics when used to search for underground water, for example in desertic areas for humanitarian purposes as well, like readiness for earthquakes or other catastrophes, volcanoes, etc. right? So the Atlas provides a vision of all areas of application of geophysics, including mining and uh, yes, uh, resource management related, of course, to oil and gas. When you ask me that the, the, the energy is in a low moment, uh, I would add to that, that, yes, we are in the per perfect storm after COVID and in a low oil price situation. That is a perfect storm for the layoffs and all that. But it is also an opportunity to reflect, right, about uh, what is that we really need as a society. We need energy, Daniel, and energy still is in a moment of transition. Right? So the energy transition goes from using oil and gas to increment the utilization of non traditional sources of energy, wind, solar, and others, right? But that does not mean we are going to stop overnight the utilization of oil and gas. You cannot run your electric car, Daniel, that perhaps you have parked at your house, right? If you don't charge it. And uh, the electricity comes most probably or from a hydroelectric uh, power plant or from a gas oil, you know, uh, fueled electrical plant. So oil and gas is still needed for so many applications, particularly for heating and cooling of buildings, as well as transportation. Think about airplanes, right? Hydrogen uh, as a fuel still has uh, some path to follow. So there is a contradiction, yes, uh, in the sense that oil and gas is envisioned as a very pollutant and uh, contaminant industry, but perhaps we need to improve the messaging and how we showcase the many advances that the oil and gas as an energy industry has. Uh, protecting the environment and reducing the CO2 footprint. Because the other side of the, of the coin, this is a very shiny coin. In one side, there is the production of oil and gas. And in the other side is the provision of energy at cheap, available, affordable, and reliable uh, workflows in, with which people in Latin America, Africa, Asia can come out from poverty. So we cannot forget that. And I think that is important. What about the many colleagues that they are losing their jobs and um, the 
restriction of the market for geoscientists. Uh, how do you see this problem? Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, careers are a roller coaster. There is no such a path as a permanent uh, ladder that you will climb all the way to the top or a road that doesn't have any holes or maintenance to be done. In life, as in a path, there are bridges, there are uh, holes, there are, you know, tunnels. So I think that perhaps some of us, uh, some of our colleagues find themselves in, in a tunnel right now. But uh, some of the recommendations to come out uh, successfully from this moment is to understand that they have a set of skills which are transferable, okay, to, to other uh, applications and segments of, of application of uh, geosciences. And uh, secondly, uh, resilience is based on long-term goals. So I would suggest expand your network, making sure that uh, you have a very polyphasetic uh, network in many areas of, may, of different uh, regions of the world, of different experiences and sectors. And secondly, participate and volunteer in professional societies to open uh, your mind and understand what are the newest trends so that you always get the skills uh, and become employable uh, again, hopefully very soon. Marienza, don't you think that with the clear decrease of uh, interest in the exploration, not only by the oil companies, but also by governments, like let's remember France or New Zealand, that they banned new exploration in their offshore. Aren't you afraid that uh, we are losing the incredible amount of knowledge uh, put together in the last century about subsurface? Well, I think the knowledge is already being uh, transferred towards the optimization of production and the estimation of the ultimate recovery. Um, EOR techniques that uh, you cannot say they are on a mature stage yet, they will uh, have to be incremented in every single reservoir in the plant. I, I see there is a good uh, side of that uh, new legislation prohibiting exploration because that will uh, impose uh, an acceleration of the recovery techniques. And that is good to preserve sensible areas. May those be offshore, deep water, and especially um, areas near to the poles and uh, jungles. Uh, just as, as it happened with oil and gas, if you don't curtail the investment in exploration, things will continue to just uh, look for the easy oil, let's say. It's time to look for the difficult oil and we can do it. We have the, the technology to do it and we need to expand on the ways of doing in a safe way with the environment. Well, Angela, going back to the Geophysical Sustainability Atlas, uh, um, can you give us um, one example of uh, these maps that you and your colleagues created so that we explain uh, maybe just uh, one of the 17 uh, uh, goals uh, uh, posed by the uh, United Nations? And uh, what is your contribution towards one of these goals? All right, let me pick one example that I really like, life below water. Um, I would like to share uh, with you that for that one, okay, uh, we can use uh, different uh, geophysical techniques, including satellite radars, uh, GPR, electromagnetic methods, in order to uh, not only understand the, the seabed, but also uh, with the usual, you know, uh, seismic crews, something very interesting is happening. They are mapping uh, the remaining of uh, fishing nets all over the planet and helping a recovery project to pull them out and uh, reducing the hazards for under, uh, you know, for the sea uh, life in those uh, you know, areas. So perhaps the geophysicists 
and um, interpreters and processors, but especially the acquisition people that are in the marine vessels acquiring seismic, they may think that uh, they do not contribute to the SDGs, when in fact, they are one of the most tangible examples that is easy to share about how they can contribute to one of specific SDG. Another example in the is zero hunger, which is SDG number two, uh, we can use geophysics uh, for helping the massive farming needed nowadays to feed the plant. You may not have realized, but in, in places like Latin America, Africa, Asia, there are a huge extensions of terrains dedicated to single crops that need uh, reliable sources and you know huge uh, amount of water on a permanent basis. And they have uh, used as a resource uh, geophysics to look for underground uh, water uh, aquifers, right? So underground uh, aquifers, which are um, available and have to be studied, monitored in order to make sure water is always available. That helps SDG number two, zero hunger. That, those are two examples. Uh, so my Angela, I understand that um, uh, you are bringing awareness of what the geophysicists they are already doing, but they don't know because of the uh, cultural background we have, uh, maybe the lack of uh, information, uh, maybe uh, lack of information during our education uh, at school. So it's kind of an awakening. You are shaking them up and say, look, you are already doing something that is very important. Yes. What, what about the uh, potentiality that the geophysicists have. Are you in the Atlas also suggesting or proposing what the geophysicists could do more than what they already do in order to uh, reach that goal, one of those goals faster or in a more appropriate way? Yes. Um, at the end of the, of the reflections uh, that we have in the paper, we included a section of the way ahead. And in the way ahead to, uh, to further exemplify how this can be used, we uh, push for an understanding that uh, this kind of atlas and mapping to the SDGs needs to be further communicated to not only the internal stakeholders of geophysics that already need this, not only for the sense of pride, but also for an understanding of the framework in which we uh, work and uh, contribute towards these noble goals. Also to the external stakeholders, right? So in the external stakeholders, uh, we have the communities, the legislators, um, the geophysical organizations, uh, the other kind of uh, companies like investors and our value chain in every application of geophysics. And to further uh, explain how we can advance in the understanding application of the Atlas, we have included, for example, uh, three questions, just as you know, eye openers for any person reading the article. I will just pick anyone uh, at uh, randomly, and I will pick this one. Are primary and secondary schools and colleges where I live prepare to teach about earthquakes, seismicity levels, landslides, and other hazards in my locality. So as a geophysics, as a geophysicist, I am sure that each one of us can do these kind of lectures at elementary school and high school level and help the community understand the level of seismicity. For example, it's not the same if you are located in California, in an elementary school, or if you are in the Guyana Shield in, in, in Georgetown over there, uh, where things do not happen or earthquakes are so rare in a ship, right? So when you are in a, in a seismic area, you need uh, to help 
the overall society for incrementing their readiness. Another way is to be influential in promoting, approving, and engaging in the launching of legislation related to um, preservation of the environment and understanding of the underground aquifers. So uh, this global inf influencing is, is key to solve such important problems described by United Nations. So how do you start um, this global influencing? How do you practically do it? It is you, Mariangela, going sitting around somebody is the societies that uh, you belong to, that they do the work, uh, are the journalists that you are calling that they write a piece on a newspaper. How do you practically do it? Well, I think that uh, we to do it practically is perhaps uh, that is a very difficult question, Dan, and you have nailed, uh, you know, the center of the problem here where everybody needs to be a contributor. I think that the solution of uh, how to achieve the sustainable goals by the timeline, which is 2030, is a matter of aggregation and not segregation in the sense that uh, we need a collaboration and integration, integration of the efforts, right? So it is not Maria Angela in a single person or Daniel, as as a single individual who will make sure, who will achieve that the, these global goals uh, will be met. It is uh, through aggregation. There are initiatives, by the way, related uh, from uh, the energy sector, oil and gas, to support the SDGs. And if you today go to the websites of all the major oil and gas operators in the world, you go to the website of, for example, just as an example, Total, ENI, uh, Chevron, ExxonMobil, uh, BP, you will see that the language they are using to express their corporate strategies is grounded on the 17 SDGs and how they contribute to those. So if, think about that, if instead of doing these efforts individually, company by company, even if they have operations all over the world, is still not necessarily an aggregation effort. So if together the oil and gas sector as a sector will further promote what they do for energy, it would be best. This is where in initiatives like the Gaia from SPE, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, is an umbrella in within which uh, the initiative of sustainability seeks aggregation of effort in which we all work together without you know, the company boundaries or even the country's boundaries to support these, these SDGs. What would be the drive from uh, private companies, big corporations to uh, respond to these uh, 17 uh, honorable goals of United Nations, if it is not related for profit? I think the only effective driver, if you ask me, would be legislation. Um, legislation that imposes uh, preservation uh, of the environment and uh, carbon footprint. Because if you think about that, the oil and gas companies are of course companies that work for profit, inclusive of the national oil companies. Not only the international and private, but also the national oil companies require profit in their activities. It is only through legislation that comes uh, as a, I think legislation is a translation of society values into paper and a code of rules. A society has a way of acting and a look at life and uh, future that is translated into laws because that precludes what can be and cannot be done for the future and the present, right? So it is a mindset in the society what we need to happen so that legislation occurs and it is similar all over the planet because it's unfair if you think about that, that legislation in Europe is so strict about energy related to fossil energy, mining and oil and gas. 
and it's all open in other areas of the planet. So I am proud of uh, many of the, of the countries in Latin America. You know that I was born in Venezuela, right? I am Italian, but I was born and raised in Venezuela. And Venezuela, Colombia, as examples, they have very strict uh, environmental laws. And uh, they mimic many of the European laws. But other countries, perhaps even much more advanced than, than, this, uh, than Colombia, for example, in Latin America, do not have this kind of legislation to restrain the way you operate and curtail the uh, carbon footprint. So legislation is the driver. Why do you think uh, this very last sentence that you said, um, why, why do you think that uh, some uh, countries that are more developed than uh, Colombia, as an example, they have less strict um, laws related to environment? And what is the meaning of this choice? I think that uh, societies who are collaborative and have valued uh, historically uh, the community and the social uh, values above profit or profitability are uh, societies uh, which laws reflect their values. And that is why uh, you see these differences. When you enable um, economics over so, uh, society values, um, then you have, you cannot reach an equilibrium and hence you cannot reach sustainability for uh, the world. In a way, Europe has always been a region in which society is valued. Think about that. There is a provision for social care, health care, this kind of uh, things, retirement funds. There is also uh, special legislation for people with different abilities in life, right? And uh, perhaps in other places, uh, still to develop, right? And you can pick some countries in Asia or Africa as examples. There is a need uh, to access energy because the levels of poverty, unfortunately, are very large. And uh, access to energy requires cheap energy. And production of cheap energy is uh, difficult if legislation, uh, very strict legislation was to be applied. So I hope you agree with me that we need the same kind of legislation all over so that prices can justify to be the same all over, right? Maria Angela, you talk about the sustainability in, uh, from the point of view of the national oil companies, uh, but also about the international oil companies. So one of the, the, the first ones, uh, they are national, maybe sometimes public, uh, owned by the government. Uh, uh, the other ones, they are completely 100% private. What do you think is the uh, difference on their point of view on sustainability? Um, there are a variety, uh, a spectrum of uh, standings uh, when uh, sustainability is referred to. I would say that uh, national oil companies are obliged to take care of sustainability because uh, generally uh, they are the main source of income of their country. So you can see very noticeably that they care about, for example, the young generation. Every national oil company will highlight their young talent and have a very dedicated training programs, generally, you know, for their young, for their youth, because uh, they have objectives at long term. And the, the way they develop their resources also implies that any development has to last uh, decades so that they have stability in, in economical terms. Other companies, especially private companies, uh, not necessarily have the same drivers. The driver is generally economic. And because of that, um, not necessarily they will comply with uh, what could be noble causes of uh, sustainability in terms of environment preservation or carbon footprint. So 
what I have seen happening is that they follow what is required by law. Some of them uh, go many steps further and because of their own uh, convinced, uh, values and the way they look at their, the, how they want to maintain their business sustainable, they pay attention and do more than what is required by law to reduce their carbon footprint and also to help the communities around their operational areas to develop. So this is something very lowable. Yeah. I bet that with your colleagues when you wrote the Atlas, um, you thought about how to engage uh, uh, the different uh, parts of the society or stakeholders. So we haven't mentioned um, the universities or the non-for-profit ONGs. What do you think about these two elements? Actually, uh, when, when we developed the, the paper, we did uh, tap into the universities and academia uh, world. And one of the focus groups that uh, when, we, when we activated this mapping to the SDGs, we envisioned that this required uh, a consultation process to start gaining the buy-in from, at least from our internal stakeholders in geophysics. And one of the, we, we decided to launch uh, some focus groups. One of the focus groups, uh, I think the number two was related to academia and research. So we invited representation, a representation from geophysics departments of several universities uh, to participate and tell us their feedback. I mean, it is in the university where you gain this sense of understanding of what will you do as a geophysicist. I think it is in the university where many times is the only opportunity you gain uh, access to different aspects of your discipline. Not only the students, but also the faculty have a big role to play, especially the faculty and the researchers, because it is thanks to them that we also create uh, new trends, technology, and the perspective that, this, that the future professionals will carry to their different sectors of application. So these concepts of sustainability are seeds and uh, you plant the seeds in, in the students. Let's hope to find some fertile environment uh, where the seeds are planted because the, the skills and knowledge to contribute to sustainable development are often they're missing from the traditional education, at least in earth sciences or geophysical departments in, in general. What are the essential skills that are needed to contribute to sustainable development. So in here, I'm like pushing even farther the envelope. So you said to the professors that they have to care about this, that they have to teach about it, but, but tell me something about the content. What should they teach? Um, they should teach uh, the urgency of uh, attaining the sustainable goals. I mean, 2030 is round the corner. And uh, we need to do something ASAP uh, to make sure that everyone around us know about the SDGs and how they can contribute to them, right? And there is uh, two factors which I think as a skills, you are, you are asking me about skills. One of them is communication. And, and I want uh, this moment to, to open a parenthesis and praise what you are doing. Uh, I think that communicating and opening a, an opportunity, a platform where we can hear about these topics is so important because uh, many times it's not even available at work where you have very tight deadlines uh, with um, a lot of technical things to deliver, etc. And uh, at the university, of course, you have your tests and exams to pass. So having the ability to communicate is pivotal to this effort. And the second thing is uh, to make sure that uh, you have uh, the best quality you can obtain and deliver in the work you do every day. 
Because if there is something we demonstrated with the ATLAS, is that every single geophysicist or geoscientist for that matter, doing a good work is contributing to society. So doing a quality work and communicating what you are doing beyond your usual small circle of work is valuable. I see that point. And uh, actually, I would like to ask you, Maria Angela, where did you learn uh, these um, skills of communication? You are a physicist, you became a geophysicist, you are a rounded geoscientist, uh, but you have a special uh, touch in communication. So I would like to ask you how you learn it or if it is just a gift uh, so that the others, they can um, follow your example or they can find a place where to be trained or just maybe find inspiration because of what you read that is maybe unrelated to your profession and is just about, you know, history books or novels or philosophy, who knows? Um, I think that I was born a storyteller and that um, for me, it was uh, inspirational to follow and, um, movies and um, admire particular actors that were able to convey uh, ideas and concepts. Give, give us an very, example. Very, very complex concepts in simple terms. Well, uh, I studied uh, physics, right? And uh, when I studied that, uh, I remember, for example, that, um, okay, that I was, uh, when, when one of the first classes of uh, um, quantum physics, the professor uh, derived the equations of uh, Einstein, mc square, and how it came to be and explain all that when he finished and uh, we were able to see this, you know, in a simple term explained in such a way that uh, was wonderfully simple. I, it, it was a motivation for me. I said, I want to be like him and be able to explain difficult concepts in a simple way. But, but I would also say that I, I had a grand, uh, my grandparent, my grandfather, Italian. He was a, a, a football player. He, uh, is, he has a Wikipedia page. His name is Giuseppe Ferrari, was Giuseppe Ferrari. And uh, he migrated to Venezuela. So he was a famous football player when they were not paid. So uh, when they migrated to Venezuela, they had a completely different business. They, had, uh, they opened a restaurant in Venezuela. So my grandmother would do the whole work and he would do the storytelling with the clients and all that. And I, I was a, a child and I was looking at my grandfather telling all kinds of stories about his years as a footballer, right? Soccer, this is. And uh, it was fascinating. I think uh, my mother inherited that ability and I have seen her uh, from telling a joke to tell a story uh, fa with fascinating ability to do that. And uh, perhaps I inherited a little bit of these two giants of the storytelling. And uh, it has helped also that I discovering myself uh, the ability to simplify complex concepts to make them understood by teaching others. When you, when you are a teacher, you learn, uh, you have to learn how to communicate to make yourself understood. Uh, Mariana, thanks for sharing this uh, with us. Uh, what is now uh, going into your professional life, um, which we know it overlaps a lot with the private life as uh, for many of us that we are passionate about what we do at work. Yes. What, what is your moonshot? Well, I would like uh, now to advance in, in the sustainability field and make a difference in that, especially for uh, geoscientists. 
Um, this first step of the Atlas, I hope, is a, a good cornerstone from where to advance and do more. Um, my moonshot would be to be able to create a large program for elementary kids because it is there where our future is nested. You mean in and, the United uh, States? In the, now I am based in Houston and uh, most probably I will um, be able to do things here in the United States, but I want to do that through the professional societies. And I am thinking in particular to do something for the three main ones that are relatable to what we do in geosciences. We have SEG, AAPG, EAGE, and maybe also SPE, we can uh, ask for that, so that we have a program of sustainability for kids. In that way, uh, everyone that belongs to this society could expand and replicate what we do. I am convinced that aggregation is a solution, collaboration. It's not a single person solution. It is all of us who will be a piece of the puzzle and a piece of the solution. So this is my, my moonshot. <laughs> Maria Angela, what was your most joyful moment of your career? Oh, what a question. The most joyful moment. Nobody has asked me that. <laughs> and I have been distinguished lecture twice. Um, I think uh, that maybe the, the most uh, joyous moment was when in Venezuela, I was for the first time in my life promoted uh, project uh, manager and led the first uh, 40 seismic in Latin America. Do you remember the moment when they told you that you were going to lead that project? Yes, I was, uh, I was at the workstation and I was interpreting in particular the <laughs> a very interesting uh, block, um, W6, in the Maracaibo Lake area. And uh, I had returned from the Colorado School of Mines with a master uh, in geophysics in reservoir characterization. And um, I was doing this interpretation and the section head came and told me that uh, the three operators in Venezuela had approved uh, the budget to launch a project in Fort De Seismic. And I said, oh, wonderful. And who is going to lead it? Because I assumed that I was going to be on it. And the guy said, well, who else do you think you will be? I said, what? Yes, you will be. And how I'm going to do it? You will figure it out. And then he left. And uh, that's, that was the moment. <laughs> Maria Angela, you have been traveling a lot. Uh, not only you uh, born in Venezuela, you are Italian now in Houston. You have been 14 years in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, you have a husband, uh, you have a family, uh, you're a pianist, uh, many choices in your life. What are your regrets? Regrets? Uh, perhaps not completing my PhD when I was at the School of Mines and uh, not going out from Venezuela earlier. And uh, that taught me a lot. Uh, changing jobs uh, teaches a lot and uh, opens the mind, not only for the multiculturalism, but also you become more flexible as a professional, uh, more open-minded and, and you grow a lot. So it's not a regret, it's just as, as things happen. But I would say that uh, those are very minor reflections perhaps. But um, that is it. I don't, think, I don't think I have regrets. Well, that is important for us because uh, knowing uh, you through your stories, your, your dreams, moonshots, uh, uh, joyful moments and regrets are, is, is a way to know who you are that you probably never write in a paper or in an article related You're to right. sustainability. Yes. I think it is very important to highlight this human side of uh, the scientists uh, that they are trying to move on um, the science 
outside of science itself, like you are doing. So thanks for sharing this. We still have a couple of minutes, Mariangela, and I would like to give you an open mic uh, so that you can address uh, the audience uh, pitch uh, and uh, tell whatever you couldn't say during this uh, hour that we have been chatting together. Well, uh, what I perhaps will take this opportunity is to uh, encourage every single person listening to this to engage in volunteering for your community and uh, for uh, reaching out and understanding by yourself what is sustainability. Uh, going to the UN uh, websites, there is a lot of materials that even yourself, you can use it, uh, not only to educate yourself about sustainability, but also to figure out how uh, to apply that in your own life profession and what you do. And, and another thing we can all do is find what is your own carbon footprint. Google it, gain uh, an application, download an application or do it online on any of the websites compare the different results of different websites, right? But understand what is your own carbon footprint. That would be my final message because with that, I think that was an eye opener for me uh, about what really impacts your, your what, are, uh, what is your trail in this planet. And uh, with that, I think it's a, it's a good message to leave in the audience, yes. Thank you so much, Mariangela. We have been in conversation with Mariangela Capello. She is consultant for a consortium at University of Houston and also for Geopark, an oil and gas company. She is director at large in the Society of Exploration Geophysicists and a honorable member of the Society for Petroleum Engineers. She is also distinguished lecturer this year. 2020 and 2021. It was really a pleasure to talk about sustainability with you, Mariangela, to know you thank better. You. And thank you, thank you again. Thanks to you, Daniel. And uh, have a splendid day, everybody.